We are Mike and Jeannie, and we restore old houses. In 2021, we moved to South Carolina and bought a 120-year-old Victorian house. Follow along as we put the polish back on this Victorian masterpiece. Welcome back to 1834 Restoration House. I'm coming to you from the Grand Staircase and I'd like to show you the Grand Hallway right now. Here's a door that's closed, pocket door is closed, dining room door closed, back porch closed, and under stairs closed. Now why is that significant? We've gotten into the heating season here in South Carolina and we have ducted air heat which is okay, but it's not the greatest. These old houses were designed to be heated by either coal fireplaces or possibly boiler heat. We were laying in bed the other night, trying to go to sleep. All of a sudden, Jeannie says, why is that furnace coming on and off all the time? So I got to thinking, all right, well, let's think about the layout of the house. Every single room has a door on it. The grand hallway out there has multiple doors, including pocket doors. And I came up with an idea what if we close all the doors and keep the heat in the rooms? Every room has a supply register and every room has a return register. So if we keep those doors closed, the heat will continue to circulate and maximize the efficiency. The next day I come home from work and these doors are closed. And that door is closed. And that door is closed. Well, I've got two gallons of milk in my hand. I'm thinking, how am I going to get through these doors? <laughs> well, I, I managed to get through them okay, but I thought, wow, why are all the doors shut? The doors in there were closed. Well, Jeannie comes out and she tells me about her plan. And what she did is she closed every door just like I suggested and, and tried it out. And here's what I noticed. When I walked into the back part of the house, once you get past the central hallway here that goes upstairs, the house was warm, noticeably warmer. And I asked her if she turned the heater up and she said no. So just simply closing off the central core, which goes straight upstairs, and isolating that core made a big difference in how warm the house is. So we're going to try to keep it that way for the rest of the winter. Now, if you've watched our earlier videos, you'll remember that there's no heat upstairs. So all that heat goes up, warms up the upstairs. If you look at what the old timers did, it was actually pretty smart. As Mike said, I tested his theory and I was able to do that because this whole central area can be all closed off and we're able to get from the office to the tool room, through the bedroom, through the bathroom, through the back hallway, to the kitchen and the dining room with so many doors you can go all the way around. It's perfect, I love it. And I love that it was much warmer. We're outside now, and this is where we're planning on putting the electrical box. But before we get started, I'd like to thank each and every one of you for watching our channel. You've been with us now for probably a good eight months, and the channel has continued to grow. There's millions of other channels out there right now, but you guys have chosen to watch this one, and I thank you very much for that. So now, does this look scary? I mean, look at that. Peeling paint, hanging shutters. Does this look like an abandoned house? Well, it should because it was. This house sat vacant for about 20 years before anybody moved into it. And, well, that was us, but anyway, it was vacant and we do have our work cut out for us. Now, before we can put the electrical panel up here, we have to get the paint off of here and then redo the paintwork. We can't just paint over it and it's going to take a good deal of work to do that before we can actually put the panel up. But a lot of people have asked, why not put the panel over here where the old one was? And why would you want to put it on the side of the house? Well, the answer is everything from here on back is an addition that was built in the 1960s and it wasn't done as well as the main part of the house. And Part of our long-term plan is to tear this off and then extend the back of the house and make it bigger than it is now. But we're gonna do it in the old fashioned style. It's gonna be plaster, it's gonna be wood, brick. It's gonna look just like it's always been there. But the thing is, this stuff is in the way. 
And if we put a new electrical system right here, it's still gonna be in the way. Well, you say, why don't you put it in the house? The reason is we don't want to put something that's invasive into the old part of the house because it's so um, old and original and we don't want to disturb that. Well, why don't you put it back here inside? Well, we can't do that because when we eventually tear this off, now we've got an electrical system that's in the way. So the best way forward, we think, is to put it right here. It's kind of around back where it's not so visible. And I think we can make it look good and be functional at the same time. So let's talk about this for a minute. This is the most important thing in a house electrical system, and it's called the ground rod. Now the ground rod is a ferrous metal that is coated in copper. This is not solid copper, by the way. Um, if it was, it'd be worth a fortune. But this rod has to be driven into the ground all the way down until it's just barely out of the soil. Now, code here in this part of the country requires two ground rods, not one, because the ground conductivity of the clay soil that we have isn't really all that great. So they say that you have to have two rods no closer than six feet apart. So what I'm gonna do is put one here, and I'll go over there and put another one, maybe six to eight feet away, and we'll drive them both in. We're gonna do a little bit of tool time here. So how do you get an eight foot rod to go deep into the ground? Well, you could pound on it, which is what we did back in California when we had an old 1950s house, and we did exactly the same thing we're doing here. That was tough because not only was the soil clay, but it was dry clay and it had gravel in it. So there's a better way. This is a special tool that's made just for that purpose. And that tool goes over the end here, like that. And it's made to fit a rotary hammer. Those of you who've been with us for a long time probably remember this tool from back when we were up in New York and we were trying to knock mortar out of the basement walls. It's exactly the same tool. And what it does is it basically just goes bang, 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 and just kind of drives, drives into whatever is in it. I'm putting the rod close to the house or close to the foundation because I don't want any mower to hit this in the future. And you also may be wondering why I'm putting it so close to the downspout. Well, the thing is, the name of the game here is conductivity. You want the least amount of resistance to ground. And guess what water does? It increases conductivity. After all the knocking around we did yesterday, this is as far as we were able to get. This bulldog, as wonderful as it is, just doesn't have enough force to drive a ground rod very deep. We went down and rented this thing. Now, that should get the job done. There are times when you need to use the most powerful tool you can get your hands on to get the job done. Because what if it gets done in 10 minutes versus two hours? That could be pretty significant. So let me demonstrate the tools side by side. First is the bulldog. And now the big guy. Right away I can feel the difference and it actually, without me pushing hard, is starting to drive that rod down. What I just did there maybe took a minute, a minute and a half. But to get to that point with the other tool from last night, it took us about an hour and a half to get down to that level. So it definitely pays to have the right tool for the job. 
Uh, the small amount of money it costs to rent these things from your tool rental outfits is uh, absolutely worth it. As we mentioned before, the ground rods need to be no closer than six feet apart. So I chose eight feet. I've got the ladder set up and I've got the rod in position, propped against the house there. So let's get up there and get started. It took maybe two minutes, maybe three, I don't know. Wasn't timing it really. But the point is it went fast and it went easy and we're done with it. So now the tool can go back to the rental yard and we only get charged for maybe a half day's use instead of a whole day's use. So having the right tool for the job is definitely a bonus. When I first started, just the weight of the tool pushing on it and the, the tapping going on was enough to get it to go in the ground. And you saw how fast that moved in just the first few moments. And that was because the soil was nice and wet, nice and loose, and it went down. Finally reached a point where I needed to put some pressure on it, and then towards the end, I'm just really just digging in with all my muscle. So, well, what little muscle I have. Anyway, we're done. We're gonna go take this back, and then we'll come back and film some more. I'm digging a small trench between the two ground rods. because I have to put a heavy copper conductor between them and I don't want that just laying on the ground. So I'm setting this up that once it passes inspection, we can just go ahead and bury it. Three o'clock. Oh, look at that. There's a rock down there. Or something. What is that? Oh. I just found the sewer pipe. Well, thankfully, I put the rod there and the other rod there and not right down the middle of the sewer pipe. That would have been fun. This is called an acorn clamp. And this is how we're going to clamp the wire onto the rod. So my first step will be to unwind the coil. And I need about eight feet. I'm going to take a clamp and slip it over and let it go down. That's the clamp we'll use over there. Now, the code says when you tie two ground rods together, they have to be done with a continuous run. You can't 
go from this rod to that rod, cut it off, and then go from the box down to that rod and cut it off. It has to be one continuous run of copper. You'll see why that's important there in a second. So let me just straighten this up. I'm just trying to take the curve out of it. Here's my other acorn nut. All right, I'm going to take the conductor and put it through the clamp. And then I'm going to take the conductor and bend it down into the trench like that. I want this to be mostly vertical. So now, now that that's all together, I'll go ahead and screw down the clamp and make sure the conductor is at the back end. Now let's tighten it up. There we go. There's so much force on there now, it's actually starting to deform the clamp a little bit, and that's great because that means it's good and tight. Now the conductor is laid in the trench. Let's go to the other end and check it out now. We still have our uninterrupted copper. Let's lay that down in, in the trench. And now I want to bend it up. So, it's a little bit stiff, yes. Okay, now, remember the acorn clamp that I put on there earlier? I put that on early on purpose so that we can do this. There we go. That allows us to put the conductor on and tighten it up. Now, imagine, if I hadn't done that, how in the world would you get that clamp on there? Well, you can't cut the wire, and you can't cut the clamp. So that's why I put that on early. Let's go ahead and cinch that down. Good and tight. There we go. All right. I'm going to leave this here just like it is. When we get our electrical inspection, you want to see all of this. And when we get our electrical panel board equipment, then we can just go ahead and bring this up here and make a connection there. So for now, we'll just leave it. It's Halloween night. We've got our lanterns lit and we are ready for trick-or-treaters. Hi. Hi. Happy Halloween. Thank you. Here you go. You want one? Thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. So here in South Carolina, they do it by vehicle. <laughs> yeah, it seems like everybody drives. I think that's because... It does. I think that's because the houses that are hosting it actually are few and far between, so... That's what I'm wondering. to drive around. Yeah. Mm -hmm. hmm. It's a new thing for us. Yeah. <laughs>
Well, it turned out to be a nice day today. We got a lot done out there. Yes, we did. The last time we showed you our lanterns on the porch here, we were complaining because the street light out there was shedding so much light that it was really interfering with the, the ambiance here. Uh, well, the street light burned out the next day and we haven't had it since, so we're really enjoying the darkness. Living in a small town in South Carolina, we're learning a little bit about some of the local customs here. So the trick-or-treaters arrive by car. And where we come from, when you do Halloween, most everybody's got something. You just go door to door and you get your goodies. Well, here they come by car and they'll stop. A bunch of kids pile out, get their stuff. They pile back in the car and then they drive along. But the thing is, the houses with their porch lights on are so few and far between that there aren't very many. And I think that's why they have to drive around. Now, this place having been abandoned for so long, people aren't used to stopping here. And I think the fact that somebody's actually here is kind of mind blowing to a few people in the village. Some people do see the lights and they stop and they get their goodies and we exchange our pleasantries with them and then they go on their way. Here's a fun fact. In July of 2019, we bought a 1834 Second Empire Mansion. That was the house that we had before this one, our first one. That's also the time that we started our YouTube channel. Now, fast forward to December of 2020, all of a sudden the channel took off and started growing like crazy, and today we're almost to 10,000 subscribers. But let's go back to that day in July of 2019 when we started the channel. Right away, we got our first subscriber. His name was Jason Fuller. Jason is still with us today. He's been with us through this entire journey and he's our very first subscriber. And so to commemorate that, we're going to send him an 1834 coffee mug. Here's to you, Jason. Cheers. So we want to put the electrical panel here, but we have a problem. The paint under here is chipped, cracked, and it's in bad shape. So if we put the new electrical on here right now, we'll never have an opportunity again to fix this. So we have a solution. We're going to use infrared heat to soften up the paint and then we'll scrape it off. So I'm putting the heater up there and letting it warm up the paint. Usually the paint will bubble up in the smoke, but ours isn't doing it. Is it because it's too old? I don't know. Is it because of the composition of the paint? I really don't know, but nonetheless, with a little bit of heat, the paint just comes right off. Then at some point it cools down and we just put the heat back on it and try it again. There's a definite advantage to doing this. One, you don't have to buy gallons and gallons of paint stripper. Two, you don't have to work with paint stripper, which is loaded with chemicals. All you need is a little bit of electricity and uh, a little bit of patience. But the neat thing is you don't have to wait. You can go right at it. You don't have to wait 24 hours or 48 hours for the stripper to do its work. Just get the heat on there. It makes the old hard paint turn soft and it breaks the bond with the wood beneath it. So now you can just scrape it right off. Now this paint here is really thick. I don't know how many layers are on here, but we have a whole bunch of different layers, mostly white and beige, white and beige. 
white and beige. I don't see any color in this. So we have to be careful we don't gouge the wood. It, it's old and kind of fragile. Now, once this is all off of here, we have bare wood. And the last thing I want to do is come back here and grab a can of paint from Home Depot and start slathering it on. That is not a good idea. With this old bare wood siding, it needs to be nourished. It's old and dry. So we're going to make up a special old time concoction that we're going to put on here, and that'll nourish the wood. And then we'll come back and put some primer on it, but not just any primer. We'll show you that sometime down the road, maybe not this week, but probably next week. And uh, next week for sure, we'll show you more of the paint stripping process. I know this is the kind of stuff you guys want to see, restoration, so we're doing it right now. Time to scrape some more. See how that just comes right off there? Really, really nice. You probably can't see it on camera, but there are, are several layers of paint um, that had chipped off over the years and people just kept slathering more paint on top of it. So you've got these, these big craters, I guess, of places where the paint has peeled off in the past. It's really rough looking. And I'd really feel bad about slathering another coat of paint on this today. It takes a little bit of effort to heat through all those paint layers. I've been experimenting with this a little bit and it really helps to leave it on there quite a while, just to really completely heat soak the paint. Now it is possible to set your paint on fire if you leave it on there too long, so we don't want to do that. But we want to leave it on there long enough until you start seeing a little bit of reaction. I'm starting to smell old paint, so that's a good thing. It means it's getting hot. Um, and I haven't yet seen the paint bubble or smoke like they say it should. But then I have no idea what this is either. By the way, we're, we're catching the paint chips down below in a piece of plastic so they don't get into the soil. Okay, that was on there a good long time. Here we go. Yeah, see that? So with a good hot soaking, I can take off a whole lot more. So it looks like, you know, you sacrifice a little bit of time holding it there, but you save a lot of time by not having to reapply it quite as often. It's a little bit chilly out here today, so things are gonna cool off quickly. Yeah, this tool here is really neat. It, it has rounded and squared off blades. Okay, I've got it nice and hot. There's always that little bit that sticks, no matter how hot you get it. But it just takes a little bit of work, a little bit of patience. Okay, a lot of patience. Thank you for watching this week's video. If you like what you see, please like and subscribe. We are close to 10,000 subscribers, and that's very exciting for us. We'll see you on the next one.